you. Good to see you all here and so early in the morning. And I want to welcome the new guests who came aboard. Uh, we have had a remarkable jo uh, journey across the Pacific, and now we are going around New Zealand. I'll be talking about our ports today and the kind of the survey, and then on Tasmania and something about Australia. I'm traveling with my dear friend Julie Warden here, who's there, and we're, we're happy to meet you and have a drink or, or a correction in my case, because I have to uh, apologize for my, my Yankee accent. And I already have gotten in trouble uh, pronouncing both Maori words, uh, New Zealand names, and, and I'll be more in trouble when I get to Australia. Uh, but uh, it reminds me of, well, that we all don't have an accent. We just have a personal vocal perspective, right? Well, anyway, it also reminds me of a tale in uh, Misunderstanding in Asia, which is a common theme where a Caucasian gentleman had a formal dinner with an Asian gentleman, and they introduced each other, and one said, oh, I'm Mr. Smith, oh, I'm Mr. Lee. And so Mr. Smith says, what kind of an ease are you? And Mr. Lee says, what do you, what do you mean by that? Well, are you Chinese, Japanese, Taiwanese, Indonese? Well, I'm Korean. And so then Mr. Lee says, and Mr. Smith, what kind of e are you? So what do you mean by that? Are you a Kiwi, an Aussie, a Yankee, a Turkey, or just another honky? <laughs> anyway. Well, with that, I'll, I'll uh, go on to the, where we are. Uh, of course, we've already been to Auckland. We were on the North Island. Uh, we were in Tangaroa yesterday. I'm uh, oh, sorry, Taranga. And I'm just going to sort of skip to our different ports and show you some things we may see and some things we might not see, just because this is a very dramatic and beautiful country as we know already, having been here many times, but uh, there's always something of more interest. And so we have come down the coast uh, from Auckland down to um, Taranga, Mount uh, Manganui, and you no doubt saw this. I'm just going to show it to you again just because it's, it's worth seeing again. That particular great volcanic cone is a remarkable feature of this harbor, and some of you hiked around it or all the way to the top if you're brave. And that ha used to have Maori fortresses on it also. There was a stronghold for the iwi, they call the Maori people in this area. Now, of course, it's a major um, rec resort and uh, recreational site. And you may have also seen, as we came in and out of the harbor, the great statue of uh, Tangaroa, the, the god of the sea. Uh, and it was on this site where there had been a dispute between the different clans and particularly a uh, man came and captured a woman, and then the other group decided to attack, and then the, the woman appealed to this god to save her, and the god summoned all of the fish and the whales to come and attack the fort. This is a, a compl complicated uh, Maori story, but the whales came up and breached the fort and bashed in the, the enemy's fortresses and saved the girl. And then all of the fishes and, this, and the whales went back to sea to have a normal life after intervening in the human affairs. But you've seen these, these great Norfolk pines that line the shore here. It's really quite remarkable, this, these trees. Uh, they're the ultimate Christmas tree. And they were, they were found originally as a tropical pine that was from Norfolk Island out in the Tasman Sea. And you have the waka and the different canoes and the recreational uh, Polynesian-style pleasures uh, next to the great terminal where we just were. And if you went into town, you could see some of the colonial-era houses, and um, I like this one, the Sir Tristram place. And uh, it's a very, uh, very pleasant town, as you saw just yesterday, with this great surf beaches and uh, the sports. Again, these uh, Polynesian sports have gone all over the world, and in New Zealand, they even have a government office for this uh, to make sure that everything's okay out there. And uh, I was reading all the tours are having this next uh, segment where a lot of them actually go upland. So there's this beautiful interior valleys uh, like the Wa Wa Waikato and with uh, this is a herd of elk that are being raised. But um, there's also cattle and dairy. But this is one particular place we, u we used to go to where they sold the fine horns for medicinal purposes in Asian markets. And of course our, our four-legged friends 
Um, the, one of the biggest products, uh, products of New Zealand, of course, is dairy products that are sold around the world. So that's the basis of the agricultural wealth of this particular North Island. Of course, the South has its you know, little cooler climate and different uh, um, uh, products, particularly sheep. But also in this area, uh, they have beautiful horse f farms. This is a uh, the, the Waikato stud, which uh, his, the horse's price is $25,000 per, whatever that per is. Anyway, we're going to go around what's called the East Cape, but I note here in that, uh, this is satellite view, see that white plume? That's not a cloud, that's actually White Island. That is the island that blew up last year, and it has been dormant for on and off but steaming. So this is a privately owned by a group of people that live on the shore of the Bay of Plenty and they've been taking uh, let's say hikers and visitors out there for years uh, except that last December it all exploded and killed a bunch of people and the island had to be closed off and uh, um, it's uh, one of the many tragedies which sort of come out of the blue for New Zealand. But uh, we, it's dormant now, but you're not allowed to go back on it because it's still hot, let's say. But we're going off to Napier, which is this um, delicious small city of about 60,000 people. But it had been an agricultural center for many decades until 1931, and the uh, earthquake came and demolished pretty much the whole town. Between the tremblers and the fires, they had a clean slate to rebuild from scratch. And this was a tremendous effort on the part of the people there and the, and the national government. And as you can read the details in the reflections, and you'll see tonight and tomorrow, they had a style of Art Deco that became a standard for New Zealand and famous around the world. So we'll go in there and we'll see all these uh, period buildings that have been preserved. And the whole center, center city was, was built as a type, and it, it has a very beautiful scale. and. Uh, decorations, but it's a living city. Um, they sometimes dress up in their period clothes, but uh, the, the, the features are there and the details, and above there's all these beautiful Victorian overlook houses that you can see the center city with. But uh, this is where it will be all of tomorrow, also after we get there this evening. Um, and there's a couple of clothing stores, if, so if you want to get uh, a la mode with 1920s flapper, uh, dresses, you can get them there, and then they have these collection of cars that drive around the town. And it's uh, a, uh, a uh, let's say, a very retro, delicious retro experience. Um, then some of the trips go from Napier up into the center with Waik uh, Waikia uh, <clears throat> and the other resorts, uh, Rotorua especially, which is a, uh, a resort with the volcanic lake and, and hot springs around it. And this was a, a destination in the Victorian era back a hundred more years ago that uh, uh, people would come all the way to go up there and have hot baths and such. But one of the warnings of the guidebooks back then, it says, do not let your children run loose. They may get steamed alive and relieve you of the troubles of parenting. So it said. But uh, I think there's an excursion up there. It's a few hours away from uh, our port, though, but it has that uh, living volcano feeling that is uh, an acquired taste, I think. So then as we come down the coast, uh, past, uh, <clears throat> out of Hawke's Bay, then around down the southern end of the North Island, we'll be into the Cook Strait. Uh, and you can see up on the upper left-hand corner, there's a, there's a tremendous mountain, um, which is Egg Mount Taramaki, or Egmont. And you can see that it has a perfect cone. Uh, it's said to have been a woman who left her, her man left her, and she was so lonely she just s stood out there looking to see for when he might come back. But that stands as a single mountain. It's a dormant volcano. Um, but it uh, dominates over the whole area that uh, used to be uh, deep forest. Now it is mostly dairy farms all around it. We will be going around into the bay where Wellington is, which is a very secure uh, harbor in the midst of a very strong currents and winds that blow through the Cook Strait there. 
And this is, of course, the capital of New Zealand. It had moved from Auckland down to Wellington to be more central to the whole country. And we'll be coming in the heads, and then the city itself uh, spreads around the uh, har harbor. Um, and this is also a very easy town to walk around. It has extensive suburbs and all kinds of things in it, but you can get off the ship right downtown and go off into the shopping area and uh, get the flavor of Wellington. Uh, it's not as big as Auckland, but it's, uh, it's also a historic town because the, the uh, New Zealand company, the privately chartered English group that came to settle many of these places, um, had a trading post there and then b developed a commercial center uh, then later it became the capital of the country. But some of the uh, old buildings are still in good con repair and uh, good state. It was also where the governor general appointed from the UK came when New Zealand became a, a formal dominion of the British Empire. So this is uh, Sir, Sir Seddon and his, his uh, casual, uh, elegant cloth. And uh, Wellington, of course, has a lot of hist historical uh, background that is there in the great um, National Art Museum. This was an exhibit that may still be on because of the centennial. There are also monuments to other fallen and other wars from recent times. And then there is the parliament. Um, this is uh, the, the, the library of the parliament, but the new building of the parliament has been called the Beehive because it's uh, that round thing, and it's a, it's a parliamentarian system, but the interesting thing about New Zealand political structure is that the Maori people have a guaranteed representation. Uh, they are about 15% of the national population, and so they have a dedicated representation in the beehive and in the parliament, and they are often the swing vote in all kinds of political discussions in, in uh, New Zealand. And also right down on the waterfront, there is the great Te Papa Cultural Center, which is a museum. In Maori, it means our place. So it especially features natural history. There's a, including one of the biggest uh, giant squids is preserved in there. Um, but also Maori architecture, feather capes, um, colonial area, uh, evidence of how elaborate the culture was. And of course, the Maori are still here, and they live, as they say, in the present tense. And so just the other day, Julie and I went uh, for a hike outside of Auckland. We came across a small huade, um, uh, which is the meeting house grounds for the local iwi people, the, the group that lives on that island. And so here's, for instance, just their daycare center. With uh, uh, It uh, has the same traditional archway and... Um, motif over the doorway, and so the kids go in there. So this is a living culture with its uh, memories that um, m were mostly carried on orally. The Maori did not have a written language until the Europeans came and gave Roman letters, and now they are very literate and teach in their own language written, and there's also broadcast and radio in Maori, and sculptures of the modern kind of, uh, that go back to the original settlers and the navigators that brought the great voyaging canoes here originally. Um, and then from Wellington, we go down into the Cook Strait. Now, that's named after, of course, Captain Cook, uh, who came here quite a number of times on his three voyages. The first one, of course, he came through, but every the second and third voyage, he came, and he, his favorite place to provision and rest on his great voyages was in the Cook Strait and in the Queen Charlotte Sound. So there's uh, settlements along the Cook Strait, but, you, uh, but this is the main transit over to the South Island. So there's a ferry traffic, so uh, you can get across. It's too wide for a bridge or a tunnel. But you can take a taxi um, and see the uh, other side. This is the very fantastic uh, northern fjord land uh, of these drowned valleys, and so this is very much... Uh, like the South Island on the lower, the southern west side. Um, but this is a very gentle um, mountainscape, waters, uh, tranquil bays. And so this is where, again, we're going into the small town of Picton, which is a transportation center, not much of a town on its own, but it is the place where you go off for going up to the countryside uh, vineyards or you go out kayaking in this uh, beautiful uh, estuarial mountain 
land. There's also the great Abel Tasman uh, National Park to on, on to the northwest side of it, named after the discoverer. And then again, the Maori have uh, a lot of legends about this whole area. I mean, this land is very magical, as you can tell from just our short visit so far. But this is the um, Paratatui Island, which is said to have been uh, carved by the demigod Maui with his own paddle. And he also is said to have uh, chopped this rock in half. So this is an unbelievable landscape around here. And then going down the South Island, either the west or the east coast, you have extensive beaches on more uh, uh, rain on the uh, west coast, and then you have uh, unusual rock formations on the east coast. So we are going down all the way toward uh, um, Akaroa and then down to Dunedin. Um, but we, we'll see this on our excursions to go out, see some of the, dr the drama of the South Island where you have snow-capped peaks through the spine of the, the great island. And of course, it's the, uh, the southern Alps and its great glory here. But it creates a, a weather patterns where the humid air from the Tasman Sea will precipitate on the west coast. And then there's a downfall of uh, clouds that come down and sweep across the east coast of the South Island, leaving it fairly dry and warm. And that uh, is very good for all the agriculture that is there. So we'll come down from Picton on the, it's just on the cross from Wellington, and we'll come all the way, we'll have a sea day down past the Karakura Peninsula, and then we'll come toward Christchurch. We're not going into the, the main harbor for Christchurch, we're going in Akaroa, which is just on the south of the Banks uh, Peninsula. You can see here the entrance, that's a very uh, tight harbor, let's say safe, and we'll anchor in there. Uh, Littleton Harbor is mainly a commercial big harbor that has a, a lot of shipment of lumber and things like that. But Akaro is an unusual town because it was a, uh, settled at first by French who wanted to make the South Island a French territory. Um, but they got a little, they got here a little too late because the British had already settled in the North Island and had the Treaty of uh, uh, Waitanga and had made peace with the different Maori peoples uh, and so that when the French came they were told that uh, the land is already British territory along with the Maori but in Akaroa the very small town of it they still ha they have the French style houses and there are a few names and gardens such that give a little bit of flavor of France and of course they have uh, a little bit of wine for you but uh, the uh, settlement of Christchurch was done uh, as an intentional religious community to save the uh, world from the troubles of back in uh, Europe and, and uh, England. But uh, uh, John Godsby came with the first five ships to settle and begin to um, make the agriculture that... Uh, is uh, the hallmark of this was called the Canterbury Plain. But he brought in, as it was quoted, sober, industrious, and honest settlers, unlike some countries. <laughs> but uh, here's the plain and the mountains in the back. So this is a, an alluvial plain that um, is very lush, and it is uh, so productive in grain and sheep, and um, the, not, not as much dairy as in the North Island. But uh, there, it is true that there are more sheep in New Zealand than there are people. And after the sheep heard that New Zealand was the first nation to give women the right to vote, they're advocating that it also be the first nation that give sheep the right to vote. May happen someday. But anyway, here's Christchurch, which is built on this flat plain and is a, a, a sprawling city, which of course has had some troubles recently, but this is the harbor where we used to go in. When they had the earthquake in 2011, there was a lot of damage done to the dockage so that we don't go in there anymore. But that's the original uh, signal tower over Littleton. And then there's a, a tunnel that goes right through the mountain right into Christchurch. What we're, where we are docking, it is almost a three-hour ride from Akaroa into the center city of Christchurch. Um, but if you see where we are and also all the ports we're going in except Wellington, there's a great industry of uh, harvesting a certain pine that is one of the major exports these days to Asia of wood pulp. Uh, these are not uh, old growth forests, these are uh, planted trees, but that's the basis of a lot of the 
wealth in this part of the country also. Um, up above, uh, look, overlooking Canterbury, there's this beautiful Gothic Inn, which uh, is a residence and also, I mean, a, a hotel and also banquet hall. And typical of Christchurch, which is, uh, has been called is more English than any place in England, because it was intentionally built to echo the old country, and it laid out parks along the River Avon, and it's still a, a very pleasant city in spite of the troubles it's had just recently. Um, so if you haven't been there, it, I, I recommend it, even though we find that some of it has been damaged and not repaired. But it has parks and monuments. Uh, there's a Maori totem next to Queen Victoria there. But the cathedral from 1904 has been damaged time and time again by earthquakes. And the problem is, is that this is a volcanic earthquake zone of the Pacific Ring of Fire, and so unfortunately these uh, human a efforts are often undermined, literally. And some of the buildings have st stood better, but um, we can see how they're rebuilding it as we come up. It was also the center for uh, exploration into Antarctica, and it's still the center for shipment to the Ross Sea and other of the many stations that are down there now. But in Christchurch, you see monuments to Scott and Frank Woolsey, the original explorers there. And so um, Australia has its own, I'm sorry, New Zealand has its own base called the Scott Base down there toward the South Pole. Um, there is an Antarctic Center Research Center and also a, a museum and display center that's on the outside of, east side of, of uh, Christchurch. But again, this earthquake, the recent one, 2011, was 7.1 on the Richter scale and it uh, killed 185 people and it destroyed about 5,000 homes, and now they have a scheme to test and then replace many of the buildings that will not survive another one. Christchurch has also had a drop in population. People have just moved elsewhere in the country and because they know what's going to happen again. And then there's that recent tragedy of the massacre there. So Christchurch is very much an afflicted city, but uh, we can see how it is when we get there if you go into the town. Then we're going down to Dedeen, which is on the Otago uh, Peninsula. Again, a very dramatic piece of land out into the uh, Pacific, and we'll come in the heads into the harbor and then into the city, which is right at the, the head of the bay there. This is a very beautiful passage into this, uh, um, the Otago Peninsula. The town itself, again, is classically laid out around a square and parks and such, but it is mostly prou proud because it was founded by Scots. And so they, uh, let's say, are out there to greet you with the bagpipes and uh, they have festivals and uh, uh, architecture that echoes Scotland. Uh, not, it's not a very big city, but uh, people go there just to see, again, an architectural display of things that are not anywhere else in New Zealand. And then there's an excursion from the train station out into the gorge. So that's one of the uh, trips that if you haven't taken it, that's well worth the trouble of uh, hanging onto the train and going up into the mountains. It's, it gets very rugged up there. There used to be a mining center. Uh, nowadays, it was used as uh, some scenes in the uh, Lord of the Rings were filmed up there. So this is one of our stops uh, to enjoy that kind of a uh, rugged landscape. And further up there from there, there's Beautiful lakes, Lake Wakatipu, and many that are up in the central um, of the center of the South Island before you get to the higher mountains. And so, if you have the time, you can go up to Queenstown and then do things like this uh, bungee jumping and uh, the, one of the many extreme sports. And in my last talk, I, I showed more of them, but I'm mean, in my reading about it. Uh, this uh, rather unusual sport was a native tradition of coming to manhood on the island of Vanuatu. And so it's a Polynesian sport originally before it turned into a worldwide phenomena. And uh, this is getting into the area that we will go around the south tip of the South Island and come up um, into the fjordland. And so this is a whole vast area that uh, we will only see from the ship, but other people go up here hiking and you have glacial uh, alpine conditions. And so this is where, as I mentioned in my last talk, Sir Edmund Hillary 
practiced and got his skills for being the first uh, of two men up uh, Mount Everest. So this is Mount Cook, which is the highest in the country at 3,400 meters. That's over 11,000 feet high. Well, that doesn't seem so high compared to other mountain ranges, but you can see the, the ocean around from there. This is a, almost a great uh, mountain range near the sea. We will not stop here, but I'm going to show you a couple of other little islands that are down on the, off the south tip. Uh, the New Zealand has a, a number of group islands. This is Stewart Island, there's Chatham Island, the further south is Campbell Island, on the way to Antarctica. But these little islands off the shore, um, have many of them have been made an ecological preserve because the agriculturalization and other impact of humans, Maori and other immigrants, have endangered many bird and other life in New Zealand because you had this primeval force that did not have large mammals, did not have many predators for the birds, particularly the, the little kiwi and other flightless birds were almost driven extinct by rats and dogs and cats and things like that. But on these outside islands, they have actually rid them of the pests and in spite of the kind of windy conditions on them, certain wildlife still continues to be uh, unendangered on these islands. So this is the Stewart Island robin. There are many different kinds uh, of endemic birds to New Zealand. This one is most curious, the kia, because it's uh, kind of a nasty parrot that likes to attack cars and bags and things. And so we had a friend yesterday who described she was up hiking in the misty uh, fjordland and the birds would come down and try to tear everything off the car her windshield and the windshield wipers and backpackers lose things, they'll just come down and take it. But they're not on the ship, I assure you. Um, then you have other rare birds that are, again, being tried to save them from extinction, the Kerakou. And uh, this one is called the Kuwaka, which is a kind of a, a, a Gotswick uh, sand piper, but it flies from Siberia all the way to New Zealand every season. And uh, the Maori question is, where does the bird go, but it always comes back? It, uh, it's one of these great uh, pelagic birds. Ones that don't fly are the blue penguin, and also that's on the North Island. And, and down to here, the yellow-eyed penguin is in the South Island and down at Stewart Island. And then there's some other very curious fuzzy feathered friends, the spoonbill. Um, and then there's, uh, this is the... Uh, Tuatara, which is a primeval dinosaur, like giant iguana, which again was uh, endangered on the bigger island, and now they have preserves on the outer islands. So if you ever come back and want to rough it, you can go on these kind of expeditions to these outer islands, particularly go south into the Southern Ocean islands of New Zealand. But we will be going around the southern tip and then come up into the great fjordland, uh, which has many entrances from the sea. So we are going into uh, desolation, oh no, doubtful sound first. Uh, this will be up to some of the conditions. We'll take on a pilot fr from uh, a shore that will then guide the ship as we go in. Sometimes we can't get into certain parts just because of the weather or the currents, but uh, this is a, about two days of beautiful um, passage in this uh, mountainous fjordland. Um, most famous is the Milford Sound, which we will certainly go into, and that is uh, the, the deepest of the fjords that go right up to the great wall of the southern Alps. Here it is at one of the entrances, so you almost think there's no way in, but this is a spectacular sea passage. If you've been through Norway and Chile and Alaska, that's quite similar, except that there are no population at all in this whole area. So there's, uh, of course, over the hill and other places, but this is so steep that there never were any settlements in this part of New Zealand. But we will see it live uh, and appreciate the landscape that is New Zealand. And this is an island nation, and it's very much maritime oriented, and I'm a, I'm a mariner, so I I appreciate that, and so the other day in Auckland, uh, we took the ferry ride out to the Waikiki Island, and the crew was wearing this shirt. So I hope we all feel Seahab, <clears throat> as uh, as he says, also peace and serenity and the best therapy. 
So this is uh, where the New Zealand has its culture, both both from the Maori and also the current, all the diverse people who live here now are very much oriented out to the sea. And again, Julie and I yesterday went out for a, a trip just like this to view the dolphins that were out, uh, I'd say about five miles offshore. And there are a number of rare types that only are in New Zealand, the Hasset and then the Maui dolphin. Uh, but yesterday we saw hundreds of them that they came pooling around trying to get fish that were also in vast numbers covering the water and then there are all these birds on top of it all. So we, we went right up to what was a, a great um, display of wildlife. It was reassuring because a lot of them have had a great decline in the Pacific and around the world of course from fishing and from entanglement and other troubles. but. Uh, they're trying to do their best and made New Zealand a leader in marine conservation and, and marine consciousness as typified by this researcher. If you can, if you can see uh, like a fish sees, you see the world differently. So New Zealand is, a, of course, it's been famous as a beautiful place and um, far from the troubles of the rest of the world, though it's very conscious of the rest of the world. So. Uh, it's a contemporary problem, as this poster in Auckland says, how do you prepare for the future when everything keeps changing? And again, that massacre that happened in Christchurch last year has led to some very strong feelings in New Zealand, and correct me, uh, any Kiwis in the audience, that this should not be happening in New Zealand, much less in all the other parts of the world, because this is a cooperative and a beneficial nation that uh, sticks together and looks out for each other. And of course the national sport is uh, rugby. That's a very big ball, by the way. Um, and the, the game, as it's referred to here, sort of unifies people. Um, but you see the kids kicking them around, uh, boys, girls, uh, all, all kinds of people go for this rather delicate sport. Uh, but it typifies the kind of cooperation that New Zealand has. And so I'm going to leave you uh, with a writing of a poet named Robert Sullivan, who is um, mixed Maori and also Irish and Scottish and English, he says. But he, he wrote, Into the new age the waka canoe glides through holes of mirrors, past the birthplace of Rangaitea, across waves of blood of the past. We are peoples united by more than genes, by more than the tongues of our ancestors reciting names of great ones. We are united by culture, by the psyche of our cultures, and our closeness, even in this age that has turned against the sacred. And I wish you a great trip in New Zealand. Thank you very much. Thank you.